Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this session of our virtual digital economy seminar. Whatever the state of the pandemic at your location, uh, I hope you're as much looking forward to hear Catherine Tucker's talk uh, as us. So I'll be brief with the formalities for today. Uh, the moderator will be Stefan Bechtold at the ETH in Zurich. And um, if you have any clarification questions during the talk, send these to Stefan in the chat window. He will either ask the question to Catherine directly or unmute you uh, to ask the question yourself. For the Q&A after the talk, we'll collect the questions in the same way. And uh, as always, one final announcement, the seminar will be recorded. So if you do ask a question yourself, uh, you will be on the recording. So uh, I'm very excited to hand over to Stefan. All right, I'm very excited to uh, introduce Catherine Tucker, uh, our speaker for today. Catherine basically doesn't need any introduction. She has uh, worked widely on online advertising, digital health, privacy, social media, um, and related topics. Uh, Catherine is not only a fast writer, but she is also very fast in identifying new topics. Uh, and so I was not surprised to see uh, that uh, she already has a Corona paper out there. And so uh, we are very happy to have Catherine presenting kind of a, a paper that's coming uh, freshly from the oven. Uh, Catherine, the floor is yours. That is wonderful. So I'm going to be presenting my research on the interaction between social distancing having high-speed internet access and inequality, and this is joint work with Leslie Chu of Occidental College. Now, this is very new research. You'll find out that the data finished six days ago. You'll also find out that I've got more data than the paper we shared because we keep on uh, updating our estimates. And what this means in general is that it's very new work and we would just love to get as much feedback as possible from this presentation about where, um, where to take it. So as I said, we're really interested in this question of what is the relative role of having access to the internet and income in people's ability to protect themselves in uh, the current pandemic? And, and why, are we, why are we sort of interested in this question? Well, I'm sure you've seen, uh, in at least in America, We've had articles of this kind from the New York Times talking about how income um, and income disparity has been particularly laid bare in the wake of this uh, epidemic. And that we're feeling more than ever the effects of inequality in terms of people's ability to protect themselves and self-isolate. And I know I've seen articles like this in the UK and I'm sure there've been other ones in Europe. But what we were interested in is that yes, we have this income effect and I think that's being talked about a lot in the press, but how does this relate back to the older literature on the digital divide? And I've got to be honest here, back in January, I was discussing a paper by Shane Greenstein at the MBR, which was all about broadband adoption. And I got up there and I said, well, you know, this is an interesting literature, but in some sense, the diffusion of smartphones and cellular data has made this you know, less of a pressing policy issue. And I had no idea when I said those were fateful words that really we would discover that I was completely wrong and that Shane Greenstein was completely right. And that as it's gonna turn out, broadband access is going to have still huge policy um, implications. But what I want to highlight in giving this story is that in general, I think as a, a sort of a group of um, digital scholars in economics, we haven't written so much about the digital divide recently. There was a literature 20 years ago. You know, the main paper I remember is Abby Goldpaw's paper, where he wrote a paper saying, yes, there's a digital divide, but if poor people get on the internet, they spend longer. And since then, there hasn't been much work on it. So I'm basically revisiting a very old literature in this paper, which is all about um, inequality, in access to the, the internet based on income. 
Now, what I'm going to find, I want to preview my results in the way of an economist who is expecting to be interrupted at any point, and just say that, look, what we're going to find is that having a high income and having a lot of uh, broadband internet penetration is going to matter for people's ability to self-isolate. But what's going to be distinct and unique and what we're going to document is that they really have a self-reinforcing effect. And that as a result, I'm going to talk about policy later on. I'm going to, you know, we're going to, I'm going to predict that the digital divide is going to have more resonating neg negative effects during this pandemic uh, than we've ever seen before. So that's going to be my bold prediction. And we can, you know, that's a provocative statement, you know, and we can see how you respond to it. So let me now tell you about the data we're using in this study. And it will not surprise many people to know that we're using safe graph data. And so if you haven't come across safe graph, safe graph is a organization which has decided to open up their data treasures to researchers during the pandemic. Usually safe graph is tracking people's cell phones for the purposes of allowing retailers and financial analysts to better understand retail traffic. And that's how their data is organized. And that's the purpose of their company. And what they've done, as far as I understand, is they've made arrangements with a variety of apps to obtain anonymized location tracking data. And you know, if you sort of want to visualize it, you know, when you uh, install an app onto your cell phone and it says, do you want, do you allow your location to be tracked all the time? Once you say yes to that permission, then that app may well be reselling this data to safe graph for these purposes. So that's their business model. But what they have done is they have opened up uh, their, um, you know, their data to researchers. And so if you haven't looked at their data yet, I would do. I've, 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 um, I've been really, really impressed by, you know, its quality and scope. Now, we're going to be looking at a particular data set, which SafeGraph has compiled specifically for the, this um, a pandemic. And it's going to track 20 million devices in the U.S. And so roughly, as best we can estimate, think that there's around 250 million smartphones in the US. So it's slightly less than 10% of smartphones. And what, uh, and you know, we can talk about selection and what that means. So what the key dependent measure is going to be is whether or not the device leaves its allocated home for the day. And this was within a distance of 152 meters. So if you go out in your yard or the street, it, it will be not registered as leaving home. But you know, if you if you go more than 150 meters, it will register you as leaving home. And um, and you know, you might say, well, how? What's the home? What does it mean by home? Basically, it looked at months previously to see the address where your device spent the most time overnight, and that's going to be the home. And so, you know, of course, you might think, well, people from romantic partners staying overnight, people who work overnight, it might pick it up. And that, that's certainly true. So, you know, do, do be aware of, of those issues. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the proportion of devices that leave their home in a census tract on a day. And if for non-Americans, just give you the idea of how big is a census tract. A census tract, we've got 77,000 of them in the US. So it's quite a granular measure of geography. And we're going to have daily data from February the 1st to April the 24th. And this means, because I've got more recent data, some of the numbers are going to be a little bit different from the ones in the paper I shared with you. I just want to sort of have an aside. Gosh, you know, in a more sort of general sense, this is very provocative data for thinking about uh, both the value of data. I mean, this is a small firm, safe graph that I've never heard of, 
who has, you know, data that I think a lot of regulators think is unique to uh, Google and Facebook. And so that was interesting to me just from that point of view. Uh, you know, it's also very provocative about privacy, right? Um, you know, this is quite granular tracking data and, you know, we're using it, you know, I hope for a good purpose here, um, but it does show us just how much data is being generated for, from our cell phones, which, you know, could, could seem somewhat at what intrusive. So I just want to have that as an aside because I find the data very interesting. Stefan, have we got any questions yet? Not so far. So if anyone okay, has a question. I'm going to keep on going. Yes, please raise it in the chat. Wonderful. So now we're going to mesh this uh, safe graph data with uh, data from the American Community Survey. And previously, at least three days ago, we were using data from the 2018 survey, uh, which was reported at something slightly bigger than a county. However, three days ago, this uh, gentleman called George Ford from the Phoenix Center emailed me. Um, and the Phoenix Center, as far as I understand, is a center that spends a lot of time um, scrutinizing actions of uh, the Federal Communications Commission uh, in the US. And he emailed me to sort of basically say, you know, I think your paper's wrong because you're aggregating to too large a level. You know, that was somewhat worrying, um, but then rather than just telling me that my paper was wrong, as most people do, um, instead what he did was he said, I have the data you need. And he managed to give me this incredible data, which uh, allowed us to know a lot more at these very granular census track levels about people's income and their adoption and usage of the internet. And so everything you're going to see today is at a far more granular level than I ever thought would be possible. And so if you're thinking about the structure of the data, we have 72,000 observations where each observation is a census tract at the daily level. And our key measures are going to be uh, household income and whether or not the household has access to high-speed broadband internet. And these are all based off a survey called the American Community Survey, which is one of our most detailed um, surveys um, about, uh, about general um, shifts in demographic and technology in the US. Now, what other data do we have? Well, we're gonna combine this with the date that states adopted a safe at home day order. Now in the US, unlike Europe, we've had quite a bit of variation in terms of what we call our orders to stay at home. Um, typically these orders, they may be called stay at home, they may be called safe at home, but they will list uh, essential businesses which are allowed to remain open at this time. And so what we're doing to identify the date of these orders is we see when was it that the governor of a state put out a proclamation saying this is the list of essential businesses which were allowed to stay open. Okay, I think there's that, a question. You know, that was obviously quite time consuming to collect and we tried to get the timing right when did the proclamation um, come into effect and match that up to the data. Catherine? Mm -hmm. Yes. There's a question from Peter Moser, who I'm going to unmute. Uh, uh, Kristen, can you unmute her? Not sure. Oh, sorry. I was wondering, I think you said it was like a 150 meter movement. Is that what it is? Yeah. That means a, something very, very different if I'm sitting in Brooklyn versus if I'm sitting in, I don't know, even in, in Zurich, right? In Brooklyn, that puts me, or in New York, that puts me in contact with like, I mean, I, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people. I can go to like all kinds of different stores. I can yeah. spread the virus. I can do all kinds of work. Whereas in another place, in a le basically it varies very strongly with density. So it seems almost like you should take into account how many other people are living around you in that 150 meter radius. 
No, I think that's interesting. I think, you know, to, to understand why it's 150 metres. So it's a, um, I think they chose, you know, sort of oddly specific. I think they chose 152. And I think, the, you know, the reasoning is, is that with cell phone tracking data, that's, you know, that's really the level of accuracy we can rely on. And then I don't know if you've ever been on the experience looking at Google Maps where it thinks you are and you're not quite there. There's going to be that sort of, you know, fudging, I guess, in the data. And so I don't think we're going to get any better. Um, your point is well taken about density. Um, and I imagine, you know, we're going to have, say, we're going to have census tract level fixed effects. We're going to have fixed effects in place for the inherent density but i can imagine that you know and i'll do it soon and i can email it you a robustness check where we just you know have some kind of interaction for the local density to deal with this right that would be sort of way forward but i think practically we're never going to get tighter just because of you know how cell phone tracking how granular we can get You're sort of, you're sort of like, I think, I think I'm, going to, I'm going to try and read Petra's face and saying that's all right, and I'll move on. Okay, I think so. okay wonderful. Um, she, she kind of smiled. Um, yeah, 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 good. No, no, it's all good. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So now, um, so we have that, and then we're going to have uh, the number of cases and deaths. I'm going to put that in the regressions. Um, you know, let's be clear, you know, what does reported cases really mean in the US, especially, you know, in March when there definitely wasn't enough testing? You know, I don't think we're going to really know exactly how to interpret this variable. I think the most conservative way of interpreting it is, you know, it's going to represent the publicized state of knowledge about the spread of coronavirus at that time, but attendant with everything we know about um, well, how, you know, how reliable that measure is. All right, and we're going to have that at the county level just because that's how it's reported in the US. Now, let me give you a sort of sense of, um, of this data. Um, so, you know, an average uh, in this period, we're going to see about 30% of these devices staying at home. And then I sort of help Petra think a little bit, you know, about her worry. Um, you know, you have around 250 devices in each census tract. There's going to be some, you know, variation, obviously. Um, and, you know, one is worrying a little bit about self-selection because, of course, to be in my device count, people have to have opted in to sharing their data continually with an app. Um, you know, Safegraph says they've done checks. That, you know this is not going to really slot the results but I want you to bear that in mind um, and you know otherwise we've just got you know a, a, a reminder about uh, general demographics within the US um, and uh, you know and our key variables at the high speed internet about where we have around 70% average penetration and um, household income which is going to be around $64,000 on average. So just sort of have those in mind to sort of make sense of these effects. Now let's uh, start to get some, uh, to some pictures. And this is all, as I say, courtesy of George Ford's amazing data. Uh, one of the things I found interesting to just plot out was to try and help me understand, well, how big is the digital pool divide um, in the US at the moment? Catherine, you know, there's a is... clarifying question. Catherine, there's a clarifying question by Julian. Please. Going to unmute him. Uh, yeah, just I just uh, want to know uh, how is high speed internet defined? Because, for instance, having an internet connection of twenty five megabits per second or less might be enough to do home office, right? So, so the question, the way they ask the question, is it does it doesn't ask about the speed. It's it, the question is, do you have high speed broadband internet, e.g. Um, cable? And it's very much a survey question, which doesn't get into the particulars of speed. 
you know, the only thing I would say is that I was once shocked to learn from one of my students that actually when it comes to high speed internet, I'm paying Verizon hundreds, you know, hundreds of dollars to very, very fast internet in this, this house. But actually what's most important is how um, reliable it is. And that above 50, me me 50 megabytes, it doesn't matter so much. That's a long winded <laughs> response to a very simple question. And the answer is, they ask a very generic question to the person. Do you have high speed internet? Uh, for example, cable, files, and then we, we don't have any more, you know, more details than that. Okay. Um, so, you know, just to just so good, you know, we've been staring, hopefully giving you a chance to look at this graph. And it does document, I think, quite well that even now in 2000, you know, 2018, the state is from, there is a persistent digital divide by income um, in the lower income brackets. Uh, around 60% of people have access to broadband, um, rising to you know just close to 90% for high income. You know, and this is still very striking evidence. You know that even very recently, there's a persistent difference uh, in internet access by high income. Now, the next thing I want to show you is a graph that I constructed yesterday, which I was really, I find really interesting, which is a graph of how, what percentage of devices stay at home per day, and how that has varied over time in the US. And so I split it up by whether you're in the bottom or top quartile of internet adoption and income in that census block. And the main thing I want you to take from this is that if you look at the top quartile in terms of both internet and income, there is a clear, discrete shift and breaking away of that particular group um, in mid-March. And it doesn't seem, there's not much evidence in the data that having either the internet or income by itself is going to be enough to allow successful social uh, isolation. Instead, there seems to be a very large shift associated with the combination. Now, one thing that you might be thinking when you look at this graph is, oh, that's you know really strange, that blue line, that's the top quartile of internet and the bottom quartile of, of income, but they seem to be, um, uh, you know, the, the groups that's less successful at self-isolation. I'm gonna just say, though it looks very different as a statistical matter, it's actually the same because there's only 151 census tracts in that particular group. And so it's not statistically different. Um, and, you know, they're, they, they tend to be um, a little bit more, um, I'll say some of that effect is going to be driven by that particular group of census tracts. So really statistically, it's the same. The big thing to take from this graph is that there seems to be just a very different effect from the combination of internet and high income, high internet, high income on people's behavior. The next thing I want to show you is you might be thinking, Ugh. you know, I'm imagining all kinds of selection, right? How can we even interpret this when we know that internet adoption and income are going to be correlated for a whole lot of other things? And I sort of wanted to give you an idea uh, just geographically about, you know, what kind of biases you might be worrying about. And this is a graph where I tried to plot out where we have high income and high internet places and where we have low income and, lo and then the dark color. Low income and low internet places are in the lightest color. And then the places in the diagonal of which there are less, as you can see, are in various shades of gray. Uh, now, Catherine, Catherine? Yes. 
there's a question on the last slide by Anand, who am I, Anand, who I'm going to unmute. Uh, I'm sorry, it was just a clarifying question. The two legend entries, the middle two legend entries seem to be the same, sir. Uh, top uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're all very, you know, these are, so your comment is that if you look at the green line and the, the black line, they're very similar. Uh, not even that, it's much basic. Uh, it says top internet plus bottom income on one legend and bottom income plus top internet on the other, so. Oh, oh I am sorry. That, that's what happens when you draw a graph yesterday and you put it into your, um, into your, um, into your, your slides. Um, the black line is the bottom internet, bottom port alpha internet, bottom port alpha um, uh, income. The blue line is one of those diagonals where you have top internet and bottom income. Um, and then the interesting line here is going to be the, I, I, the one I really want you to look looking at is how the brown line of the top quartile of internet and the top quartile of income still breaks away. So that, that was, you know, sorry that I could be better at labeling words. Um, yeah, so I was just wanting you to see this graph. And you know, if, if you were to tell me, you know, about any of the legends, what this graph would be, you know, it's sort of interesting, right? This definite selection there. You could tell me it was places MIT graduates go and get jobs. You could tell me it was places where you're very likely to be served avocado toast on your breakfast menu. You know, there's definitely going to be a lot of correlation with other things in this graph. I, I, you know, I want to sort of be up front and I want you to sort of, and then you're going to see how we're going to try and deal with this a little bit. Uh, with Catherine? There are two questions, one by uh, Anindya, I'm going to unmute. Oh, hey, how are you? Um, so on, on the previous graph, just so I understand, uh, you're basically showing that the extent of social distancing by people who are in the high income, high internet is higher yep. than the ones below them, right? Um, from what I understood, your income categories, uh, the highest income is limited to 75K and above, right? Oh, I thank you for asking this question. Here we're looking actually at quartiles. And so high income is going to be precisely above $78,000. Okay, uh, I see. So you don't, uh, you don't have the higher, the higher slabs like 150 or 200 or anything like that. So not in this data because I think okay. we have to anonymize it to a certain extent. Sure, um, that's, okay. that's okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. You know, so we're not going to have any sort of sexy stories about high wealth individuals going to the Hamptons in this data. It's, you know, it's going to be a little bit more prosaic. Sure, sure. All right. Um, two more questions, one by Sun Wu. I'm going to, go to unmute. Uh, Sun Wu, Sun Wu Wang. So I can also read the question. The question is an alternative way to explain this, maybe to say that the fact that blue and black lines are parallel suggests that what mod what matters is income. Um, you're gonna so that is one way to read it, and that's the way I first read it. Because the moment I saw that blue line being lower, I was like, "Oh, that shows it's about it's really about uh, income." What I want you to take for now, though, is that actually the blue, the black, the green line are all statistically indistinguishable. And that when we moved, I'm going to show you some results which suggest that internet by itself still matters. But what's going to really matter is this interaction. So we'll sort of go into this, um, you know, but, but, I, but I agree that when you read that, you know, you're sort of like, oh, that's a real income story there. Um, another question, Stefan? Yes, there is a question by Julian Wichmann. Who's on? Um, yeah. yeah, hi. I was uh, wondering, uh, do you also observe that people are adopting high-speed internet as a re uh, reaction to being at home more? Oh, Julian, I wish I was. Um, no, we, we honestly, we, we have data from 2018, you know, and, and these surveys, you know, that was just published a few months ago. Um, so we're not going to have any good way of tracking that. Um, but it would be, it would be interesting. Okay, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. And there's a question by Shuang Wu. 
Shangwu. So the question is, is that people stay at their parents' home also counted as leave the house? Uh, if you if Stakecraft saw that in months previously you spent most of your time at your parents' house, it would be counted, right? You know, they're not completely transparent about the period over which they did the calibration. Um, they say they're updating it over time. But, you know, if you have a situation of, say, a college kid coming home in mid-March, I'm not sure how good a job they're going to do at tracking that, to be honest. And last question for now by Christian Poikert. Uh Can you unmute yourself, Kristen? Yes. But, uh, it's actually someone else's question that just forwarded. Oh, sorry. So. All right, so I can read it. Could it be, could, could we interpret this light blue light line as people who may have access to the internet, but really these individuals are more likely to be essential? So, you know, when I saw this line, I, I got very excited about this line because I sort of felt what I was seeing is uh, in Boston, we have a town named Chelsea where over a third of people, the, they estimated around a third of people who have, have caught um, COVID-19 is being drastically badly hit. And it's, uh, you know, a poor neighborhood, but with good internet access, uh, you know, which benefits in some sense from the investments in internet, uh, you know, in the general Boston high-tech area. And I got very excited about it, that what we were really seeing was a horrible divide, that if you're in a rich area with high internet, that there's a complete divide that you have, you know, people like me sitting in my, in my house with my brilliant internet able to work from home. And then you've got, you know, a whole lot of people who are essential workers, you know, you know, bringing groceries to my door and so on. So I always had that, that mental picture of it. Um, unfortunately, it's just not statistically significant. <laughs> that blue line will be different from the black and green line. But I think it's an interesting pattern and maybe it's something we'll see, you know, as I get more data and, you know, maybe George Ford will take pity on me and give me even better data. I can maybe disentangle it. But I, you know, I, I let you have that sort of visceral reaction to it that there was even more of a divide than I thought. All right, so I'm gonna just, just just keep on going because I'm you know I was worried I wouldn't I would finish early but I'm gonna I want to get you to some more regressions if that's all right. There's one more clarification question or should should we? Oh go, should go ahead then. That's brilliant. By Christopher Keller, I'm going to unmute. Uh, hey, yeah, quick question on the income uh, quartiles. Are those um, across the entire country or within? Census. Yes, so they, I did those on the entire country and, and maybe, you know, one way, you know, I'm thinking back to Aninda's question, I can imagine I can run a different specification where we could do it within a state, right? Um, and that yeah. might be interesting to do um, because obviously yeah. I think Aninda was reacting like, you know, I live in the center of New York City, 78,000, you know, is, you know, basically on the poverty line or, or, you know, how it would feel. So, you know, that'd be certainly something I could do at the moment. I sort of just made it global, but that's, you know, I think a nice thing to do. Thank you. Um, well, these are all great ideas. This is it's wonderful to do this. Um, now, let, let me just give you some correlations in the data. And what we're gonna do at this point is, you know, when, when we look at this map, you know, as I say, you know, there's a lot, you know, a lot seems to be driven by geography. And so, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting in state fixed effects. And so, you know, we're no longer going to treat New York as being the same as, um, a, 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 you know, as Alabama. And what we're going to look at is we're going to say Alabama or, you know, if we look at variation across these census tracts in, in wealth and access to the internet, then how how are we going to see, you know, what kind of responses are we going to see? And I divided up the data into February and March onwards. And so columns one to three is sort of before in the US, you know, we woke up to the coronavirus and March is, you know, after the awareness started. And, you know, there's sort of some things I, I want you to see here. The first thing is if we look at column three, you'll see that very consistently, 
Um, before, before the coronavirus started, people with higher incomes were less likely to stay at home. And we've seen a large switch in that uh, from March onwards. Uh, you can see that there is um, definitely a response to reported cases in terms of people staying home. It does actually seem to be affecting behavior. Uh, other things I want you to see, um, you know, with the internet, you know, there's obviously going to be a, a large effect from the proportion of high speed internet in people's ability uh, to stay home. And that is going to switch again from February to March. So I want you to sort of see the big switch in the coefficients, both on income and internet. The other coefficient which we really see shifting is actually going to be uh, on uh, the proportion of Asian people in the um, in the uh, in the local uh, census tract area. And you know, one of the things I you know you know which is just there in the data. Um, George Ford, who spent all yesterday making sure I hadn't made any mistakes, was you know very struck by it and highlighted that of all the coefficients you ever measure in any of these models, the most significant and biggest shift is always the, uh, the percentage of uh, Asian people in the local population. So I'm just noting that as interesting. You know, it's not something I'm going to base the paper around, but it, it was an interesting fact. So these are sort of correlations. And remember, what we're doing is we've got state fixed effects. So we're really looking at, you know, given a state, you know, there's variation within the state in wealth and income and these and, and demographics. How do those then affect people staying home and how did that shift from February to March? And these are just correlations. I found them quite interesting and informative. Uh, the next set of uh, correlations I'm going to um, present to you. Uh, these were done like literally 40 minutes ago. And these are some uh, regression I ran where what, what I'm looking at is those figures in the bar chart. You remember where we saw beforehand just how many people of an income range had broadband. And I want you to see these interesting patterns. In that, and remember, we're now looking at percentage of broadband. So we're going away a little bit from income but we're gonna still see an interaction with income. In that, you know, for every group, it is the case that, you know, have a higher percentage of that income group with broadband is going to lead more people to stay home in April. However, wealth and income really matter. And you can see here that there's a five to five fold times larger effect from the percentage of people of over $75,000 uh, who have broadband. So I also want to put that out there. It's you know, some, you know, some evidence really struck me, you know, that there really is this, in, there does seem to be an important uh, intersection between income and, and, um, and broadband. Now, the next set of sort of results I wanted to show you is, you know, I've been very careful to just say that everything is a correlation so far, and it definitely is. We get a little bit less correlational when I start looking at the effect of a state directives. I wrote out this equation of what I'm doing, but really it's so straightforward, it probably doesn't need an equation. The key thing I want you to think about this specification, though, is that we're now going to be able to have census tract fixed effects, which are going to soak up a lot of variation that one might be worrying about. Um, and I'm now going to be looking at the effect of the sharp timing of a state directive on people's behavior. And so I'm going to do this. And um, let me show you some of the results. And, you know, I, you know in terms of interpretation, I think it is, you know, it is a little bit more causal. But remember, you know, on the date that the state directive was announced, there were probably other announcements. We're not going to capture those. And so I think the way to think of this is this is the effect of that time period where that state got serious and issued a state directive, you know, rather than sort of being the letter of law of the state directive. 
So these are the results from this specification. And I think what I want to do is to go straight to column five. And I want you to see the following. First of all, you know, this without income and without internet, there's very little, uh, you know, it's almost a negative effect. In fact, you know, she's measured everything significant because I've got so many observations of a state directive. Now, what I've done to try and make this more interpretable is that I have interacted the state directive with an indicator for being above median income and above median internet. You know, it's, it's pretty much the same if I was to use quartiles, but just it sort of aids uh, interpretation to use a binary indicator here. So that, that's what I was doing. But it allows you to start to think of the sort of relative effects above, about being above median on, on these two axes. And you can see there is a separate effect of both income and the internet. They both help people stay at home uh, after directive. And the other thing you see is that, yes, but there's also a sort of self-reinforcing effect, which means that you have a combination of high income and high internet, you're far more likely to end up staying home. And that, you know, that's quite, they're sort of reasonably, interestingly uh, equal in size. You know, if you look at them, you know, they're so precisely estimated that you can sort of say that they are, you look at these numbers and understand that they are different, um, at least empirically. You know, another thing I sort of think generally is that in the grand scheme of things, the state directive has a modest effect on people's behavior. Um, in the end, there's a lot of responsiveness to the spread of cases. There's not a sharp disconnect that we're really measuring. Um, and so I'd say that there are effects. They tend to be small and compliance does seem to be driven by both the internet income and in particular their combination. So I think this is one of our major effect things we measure. Um, and I'm gonna just make sure from Stefan there are no more questions. There's one more question from Julian Pidaigo. Let me unmute him. Yeah. So yeah, maybe uh, I was thinking about the mechanisms behind what you have uh, shown to us, but and maybe you will talk about this later. But do you have information on how many people on each county have lost their jobs during this these times? Because according to recent figures, the the number is about sixteen million, and that have uh, sixteen million people that have become unemployed, and that could explain why they stay more at home, right? And this yes. could also differ in, in, with respect to the income and, and internet and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, I sort of two things like, so we, you know, one of the very frustrating things I think for all macroeconomists is that the, the, we've got this huge lag in reporting of real unemployment. And, you know, I'm not sure if it's ever going to be reported at the census track level, which is what I need. What I can tell you is in my first version of the paper, where I was using, of all things, data from 2018 um, about persistent unemployment, there was definitely an effect in that if areas of persistent unemployment are unsurprisingly areas where you see a lot of people staying home, and they're also, um, um, you know, and, and that slightly increased after the state directives. So when we get how long it takes better data from right now, then I can sort of test it. But I think there's some suggestion that there's a little bit of that going on. Now. So uh, does Lewis have a question, Lewis Cabral? Not sure. Yeah, if, um, just going back to, to, uh, to, to your results. I mean, they don't seem like huge coefficients no. in terms of the total percentages. And what if you've tried to see how they would fit in models of uh, epidemiology and diffusion. Um, because in those models, sometimes relatively small um, percentages and rates can make a big difference. For example, in, in a neighborhood, a higher income neighborhood, uh, there being a significantly lower number of, uh, of cases uh, uh, one or two weeks uh, uh, afterwards, uh, just based on a relatively smaller percentage of, of people moving out of their homes. 
We said, I like this point a lot because I've always sort of looked at these estimates and said they're smaller, the state directs us to have a smaller effect than one might think. And there was a huge pre trend, which means that the actual timing of them mattered less than you might think. Now, I, as an economist, always feel a bit nervous about straying into, you know, trying to predict, you know, um, um, effects um, on the spread of the virus. The good news is there's this huge MIT-wide effort um, where I'm allowed to just tell them my coefficient estimates and then someone who knows what they're doing mm -hmm. is hopefully going to use them. And, you know, I'm crossing my finger, you know, such grave cost disciplinary enterprises are generally unsuccessful, as you know. But I'm crossing mm -hmm. my fingers at this time, like there's so much enthusiasm and, and you know, these are largely engineers or people with engineering backgrounds, they've got, I'm hopeful is what I'm saying, but okay. you're making me feel better about my small estimates. All right. Stay, uh, I'll look forward right. to the um, result. All right. So, you know, I okay. just want to mention, there's a lot of other things you might think is going on, right? So you see this, I show you these, you're like, well, but really I'm thinking about the sort of high income, high internet states, you know, they seem to be systematically different in my mind. I can think of other explanations about what's going on. Um, so I have this table where I sort of went through some of the major ones in my head, and I'm going to add um, Petra's idea about some density to this table. Uh, you know, the first idea, you know, maybe it's just about rural, right? Rural people, lower incomes, you know, less internet access because it's rural, all of these things. So I put a control in uh, for rural, and yes, there's definitely a big effect for whether or not it's rural, you know, if you're in a rural area, you're less likely to be, um, you know, compliant with the state directive and stay at home. But the effects still stand, even with that interaction. Um, similarly, you know, I, I was thinking about age, um, Maybe your parents are different than my parents or my husband's parents, but my parents, you know, don't behave like I want them to in terms of staying at home. You know, maybe that has an effect. And indeed, we say it, see it that, you know, when you tend to have a, an older census tract there, you know, the, 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 well, what actually you see in the data actually more likely to, to stay at home. So that, that's somewhat good news. Um, education, you might think, well, high educated people have high incomes and they're just more likely to have the internet they like being on Twitter or whatever, you know, there's a, yes, that's powerful, but it doesn't seem to explain the effects they still persist. Um, so, you know, I wanted to tell you, I did go through some of the um, other explanations, but one thing I'm really sort of hoping to get from this seminar is if you're sort of thinking, oh, this might be really what's explaining it, I'd like to add it to this table and see whether or not it sort of persists, you know, or, or takes away, you know, from what I'm measuring of the interaction between income and the internet. Catherine, okay. uh, yep. Tom Thomas Aduso has a question. Uh, yeah, hi, Catherine. Uh, I, I have a question on the dependent variable to understand a bit better the issue of selection. So you said that you have something like 20,000 cell phones. And, 20 million. Uh, 20 million. So how many, how many cell phones do you have in each of these census track? And do you have there a lot of variation? Um, yeah. So if we go here, this gives you an idea. So we have about 250 set devices in each census track. I've given the percentiles here. That's it. Um, you know, so 25th, so variation. You know, it's a bit of variation. Yeah. But not huge, you know, I don't think it's reassuring, it's, you know, because the problem is I don't really know self-selection into saying yes to an app tracking you, right, your location. Yeah. That's what worries me. You know, this, you know, I've tried running it with the raw count, nothing much changes, I guess is what I'd say. You know, there's, I don't know how else we can sort of deal with it. Yeah. But there, I think there's definitely some selection there. But that gives you an idea of the sort of magnitude of numbers we're working on. Yeah, thank you. Um, great. Okay, so I want to get on to some explanations. So I think you're like, well, you know, you've presented all these correlate, you know, these effects. What's the explanation? What's the mechanism? 
and you know, there's not going to be anything earth shattering in the mechanism. Um, it's going to, I'm going to show you that it basically is exactly what you might predict if I sort of said what's going on uh, like this. What I'm going to argue is that rich people with the internet have jobs, which means they don't have to leave the home. They are not essential workers. Um, and also rich people are very good, at, you know, maybe are not going to do so much shopping. Maybe they can, you know, order on Amazon or something like that. So these are the sort of two mechanisms that I had in my head. Um, if you've got other ideas, you know, we've had the unemployment idea. That, that's a good idea. Um, you know, that, that would be great to test. I'm going to, it's not going to be the case. I'm going to show you that one thing is the only explanation. I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, various different mechanisms. So the first way I sort of thought about looking at the mechanism and <laughs> is to um, look at the difference between people staying uh, home at the weekend and weekdays. And I just realized I did not label this table properly and I apologize. Um, column one is weekdays, Monday to Friday, and column two is weekends, that's the Saturday and Sunday. And you can actually see that these uh, effects of compliance with the state of directive vary um, based uh, on whether it's a weekday or weekend. And what you can see is that the effect appears to be strongest of the interaction between income and the internet on weekdays. So in general, the internet has the most powerful effect overall on people's behavior on weekdays, and it's gonna have a weaker relative effect um, at, at weekends. So just have that in mind. Because, you know, that's sort of one way of teasing apart from the data, you know, how important is people's work situation uh, in explaining the effects we measure. Now, I'm not going to be able to give you sort of a direct test of job types at the moment, just because I don't have a breakdown of job types at the census tract level. The best I can do is what I did was I worked off another NBR paper where um, they actually took advantage of some of the old, um, or the old, <laughs> the old AI research, which tried to work out well what task can you do remotely or automate. And you know, if you look at that research, um, there's a huge correlation in terms of the types of jobs that can be done remotely, and these areas which have high income and high internet. So I do feel. You know, this is suggestive alongside the week weekdays effect that probably a lot of what we're seeing is this interaction between having access to the internet and then having the kind of job which is paying you a good salary but can also be done remotely. And so, you know, this is this is more this is just a suggestive graph I'm just showing you that it's the top quartile of the internet and the top quartile of income, which has the most of these kind of jobs that can definitely be done from, um, remotely. But it does seem that in combination with the weekdays result, that, you know, that, that seems to be a leading explanation. Now, the next mechanism is about shopping. And I sort of, you know, that, you know, when you sort of, you know, read uh, people, you know, discussing this in, in public forums, they always mention the idea that rich people are likely to um, be shopping more, <laughs> you know, are more likely to be able to stay at home and protect themselves and, you know, have deliveries from, from Amazon or something. And actually in the data, we didn't see that this much. What we did see was that um, there's a lot more that, that rich people, uh, you know, well, whatever portal of the internet and income, we've seen a huge drop in shopping trips. Um, in general, it was rich people with a lot of internet. Uh, they actually ended up making far more trips to the supermarket in that sort of panic buying phase of the, the pandemic in the middle of March. Um, but it doesn't seem to be as driven by shopping as you might think. And I should just clarify, this is a slightly different data set also from SafeGraph, which allows us to visit, track visits to both convenience stores and grocery stores and supermarkets. 
And so we're picking this up and I'm going to say there's, you know, there's not so much evidence when you look at this graph that, you know, it's completely, it's, it's going to be that much shopping. And I also have some uh, charts. I'm going to just skip through them because they're going to sort of show a similar story that very weakly there does seem to be something uh, about the internet and income, you know, and, and stopping people going to the supermarket. But when you've got over a million observations and you've got, you know, a, a statistical significance level of, of 10%, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking this is a huge driver. Catherine, so we have we have five minutes. We have five minutes in total, and we have one question. How do you want to manage this? Let me just get to the end. I'll just say my words, Great. and then we'll go to the question. Great. So the limitations to this work is very new. It's completely descriptive. It really is. Uh, there's obviously going to be some selection. We've been worrying about that. And, you know, these findings are interesting, but they're very specific to a you know particular moment in history. You know, and I, I don't know how interesting we're going to find this in a year's time. You know, but I do think there's a broader point to doing this, which is that in the midst of pan the pandemic, uh, the ongoing contraction of the world economy, I do think there's important things we can say as digital scholars um, to document inequality associated with digital technologies. And you know, it, the pandemic as we know it at the moment will change, but this inherent inequality in its role will not. And so I think there's something more, you know, there's timely things we can say, there's also things which have potentially long-lived implications about how inequality and digitization um, interact. And, you know, I've done a little bit more work on this theme uh, recently. I've, I've been working with Anya Sen, thinking about the diffusion of the internet. Uh, among children, and that's a very depressing paper, which was really about how children who are already performing poorly in schools are likely to be particularly negatively affected by a move to remote um, uh, remote instruction. But, you know, I'm just sort of giving this as an illustration of the kind of thing I think, you know, which is interesting to do. Now, let me get to the punchline here. So, you know, presenting results, income matters, high seek internet matters, they both matter. Together, they really matter. If you put them together, there's an extra incremental effect. And this is sort of self-reinforcing. And, you know, if we're still looking at the mechanism, I've come to believe it's more about work and the types of work than it is about shopping, you know, but, you know, both are still probably there. The key point is that the digital divide matters more than ever. Uh, you know, when we think about policy, I think the paper also says there's no easy solutions. It's not just a matter of giving people broadband. It's not going to solve systematic inequality based on income. Um, you know, and so as a result, though we might want to subsidize broadband at this time because there are other benefits, such as poor kids being able to receive most remote instruction, the actual persistent effects of income inequality and their interaction with broadband will still persist. So that's the big point. And Stefan, what questions do I still have? So there are a few more questions. I think uh, because of time, we can probably do one. So let's, uh, so Wo Yong uh, Zhou has a question. I'm going to unmute. Hi, Catherine. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I have a question about the state directive variable. Uh, so do you think if there is an issue of spillovers between states in terms of staying uh, or staying at home orders? So like in the state of New York, uh, if it initiated the order, the, it probably affects the proportion of staying at home households such as uh, New Jersey or, or Connecticut because non trivial portion of people commute from neighboring states. So if this is the case, yeah. how do you resolve this? Well, I mean, I think you could, you know, the way to do it would be to, like, you'd have to run a, spec a different specification where you look at census tracts, say, on the border. You know, you could look, for example, at Westchester County, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, which I, I'm hoping, you know, and, and see if there was an effect. So I, I think it would be just sort of like a, another specification to get at that. You know, we, mm -hmm. we're not, we haven't got it in the current specification. Okay. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we are running out of time and we try to be sharp uh, for uh, for the um, seminar. There are four or five more questions uh, by the speaker. So uh, we will send you all the questions which we received in the chat and 
for the participants, you know, feel also free to reach out to Catherine directly. Um, I wanted to thank Catherine a lot for doing the presentation, for participating in this uh, novel format. I hope you got some uh, helpful feedback for a great paper. Um, and I, before we close, I wanted to turn over to Christian Poikert, who is going to announce what's going to happen next time. All right. So uh, also for me, from my side, thank you, Catherine, for, for this uh, super interesting paper. Um, we're staying with mobile devices next week. Um, Anintia Ghosh is going to talk about mobile targeting. Uh, so that's next Thursday, May 7. Um, hope you all tune in. See all right, you and, bye bye. And join us in uh, thanking Catherine. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Thank you so much. It's been brilliant. So much useful feedback. Thank you.